All right, welcome to the Young Turks. We've got an awesome show for you guys today. Uh, look, every show has its uh, fun and interesting parts, right? Uh, we hope at least. Uh, but I get really jazzed about certain different parts of the show every day that's different. Today, I'm actually super jazzed about the members only post game, which is going to happen hours from now. I've got a bunch of personal stories for you guys, including why Steve the Audio Guy's dad was the most powerful man in our town, and all he did was run a 7 Eleven. I'm going to explain why. And it explains the true nature of power. Plus, my interactions with an uh, Indian gentleman who works for Hewlett Packard who was trying to help me fix my computer while he was in Mumbai. That's going to be awesome. Okay, so I'm jazzed about that. But I'm jazzed about, of course, the rest of the show as well. In the second hour, uh, you remember the uh, Republican who was trying to be the sugar daddy for that 18-year-old boy and he pulled him in and tried to give him 80 bucks for sex? Well, we've got an interesting update on that story. Uh, among others, and uh, I'm going to start with one of my favorite right off the bat. And it's about Gaddafi and Condoleezza Rice, and it's a doozy. So as rebels are taking uh, different parts of Tripoli, they are stumbling upon uh, some of the artifacts of uh, Muammar Gaddafi. And the colonel had some interesting uh, belongings, but I thought the most interesting was an album filled with photos of former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Picture after picture. Huh, that interesting. No wonder he smiled. So, uh, what else was uh, going on between those two, and why did he have such an album? First, he, apparently he was absolutely uh, smitten with her, not necessarily uh, physically, although mm, one wonders, uh, but certainly about her African heritage. Uh, he said, quote, I support my darling black African woman. Uh, I admire and am very proud of the way she leans back and gives orders to Arab leaders. Lisa, 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 I love her very much. I admire her and I'm proud of her because she's a black woman of African origin. Okay, now, if I believe that it was just about her being of African origin, et cetera, I say, all right, that's fascinating, that's great, right? But a whole album full of pictures and the Lisa, 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 and how much he loves her, et cetera. Now remember, Gaddafi is this really strange Austin Powers-like character. Remember his uh, little uh, small army of women protectors that he's got? And they're of all different shapes and sizes and hues, and they're from all over the world, not just his African women that he loves, but also apparently some Scandinavian women that he loved as well. So, uh, but he likes the idea of strong women, and so apparently that Condoleezza Rice being this strong woman uh, really appealed to him, and that's why he kept wanting to look at her pictures, presumably. But he wasn't done yet. When she came by, he showered her with gifts in value of $212,000. He really liked her. Some of the things he gave her are awesome. Uh, one was a diamond ring. Another one was a loot. <laughs> Gee, I wonder if that's symbolic of anything. Uh, an accompanying DVD, a locket with Gaddafi's own picture inside. What are you, 14 years old? Did you make her a mixtape while you were at it? <laughs> and then finally, he gave her an autographed copy of his revolutionary green book, which I'm sure he enjoyed. She enjoyed, I should say. And then my favorite one, Wonder Woman-esque wristbands is how it's described. <laughs> Again, it goes with the idea of Gaddafi's fetish for strong women. Uh, <laughs> man, that is fascinating. It's really interesting. No matter what they are, how powerful they are, if they're a dictator, whatever it is, in the end, if they like something, you know, they just can't help but make take pictures and pictures and look at them and go, Lisa, Lisa, Lisa. And after that, I don't want to know what happened. So <laughs> I'm going to leave that story right there. So fascinating stuff. Now, we turn to uh, interesting news domestically. Uh, this story will tell you what a disaster it would be if Rick Perry got elected. Now, uh, it is a story of his questionable ethics, but I think even more importantly is his, uh, uh, the trust that he puts on a very questionable advisor. I'll tell you who that is in a second. First, it's a story of how he tried to get the teacher retirement fund in uh, Texas, specifically the Texas teacher's retirement system, to buy into a scheme uh, cooked up by a Swiss bank. The scheme involved uh, that Swiss bank profiting from the death of those teachers. 
Now, you got to be thinking, oh, come on, that can't be true. Absolutely, positively true. Now, why and how? Well, what they did was they realized that they could do this for public employees, what they were already doing for private employees. And private uh, companies, and they got in a lot of trouble, including Walmart for this, were taking out life insurance on their own employees. And then when they died, they'd cash in on that. Now, they had different ways of profiting from that because, you know, life insurance is a gamble, right? Uh, but in, they would reduce the gamble because they got tax benefits out of it. So they had found a way to basically get this huge tax benefit, and you know, if the people died earlier, they would make even more money. In fact, in the Texas case, they wanted to specifically insure, insure retired teachers between the ages of 75 and 90, so they'd hurry up and die. Okay, so this is, I mean, loathsome. So, well, you might say, hey, maybe the teacher retirement fund was in trouble and they needed it. It's that no. It was stacked up with a 94% funding ratio. It was perfectly healthy. In fact, they were trying to figure out where else they could put the money if any money was going to come in. How about the teachers? Were they going to benefit from it? They'd get, at best, they said, well, maybe we can get you 50 to 100 bucks. But you got to think about what a terrible idea this is. Because if you set up a system where the bankers and to some degree the, the government uh, benefits from people dying quicker, well, they might be motivated, you know, and, and we hope they wouldn't be, but financial incentives being what they are, they might be motivated to make sure that that happens a little quicker. So how could they do that? For example, Rick Perry, as governor, could cut uh, health care for retired teachers. Now look, it's complicated. Could he get that through uh, the legislature in Texas, et cetera? What would that exactly mean? But why would you even take that risk? And in fact, that's why the private companies got in trouble. For example, Walmart. They give terrible health care to their employees, and then they take out life insurance on them. And by the way, it's called dead peasants insurance. That's what the industry called it. Think about how gross that is, dead peasants insurance. That's how they view you, right? And that's what Rick Perry wanted to do in Texas. So who's the advisor who came up with this brilliant idea? Phil Graham. Now, Phil Graham is a retired uh, Republican senator from Texas. Uh, why uh, is Phil Graham so important? Uh, well, he's the guy who deregulated the financial industry in the first place. It was his idea dur during the end of the Clinton years, and I, this is the one thing that I think Clinton did massively wrong. Uh, he agreed to those Graham-led bills uh, where uh, the banks got the regulation lifted. And then guess what happened? P uh, Phil Graham immediately went to go work for a bank which then took advantage of those, that deregulation to make much more money for their executives in the short term, and then eventually, of course, they collapsed and needed the United States government and the Fed to bail them out. But who cares? Phil Graham and his buddies made money in the meanwhile, right? So back in 2003, Phil Graham takes Rick Perry aside and says, I got a great money-making scheme for us. And by the way, also gives Rick Perry six-figure donation to his campaign. What a wonderful coincidence. Everybody in power gets paid, and then when you die, they get paid even more. Now, apparently, Rick Perry thinks, and I'm going to quote here, that uh, Graham, uh, this is one of his advisors, he says, quote, quote, he considers Graham an economic genius. <laughs> Graham is the exact opposite. He couldn't be a bigger problem. I mean, I remember when John McCain was running, and there was talk about how Phil Graham might be Treasury Secretary. I said, on that alone, no one in their right mind should consider voting for John McCain. Phil Graham, if he got into power or, or advised anybody in power, the banks would run roughshod over us. They already do. Can you imagine it getting worse? The only person who could make it worse is Phil Graham, and he's the top economic advisor to Rick Perry, and Rick Perry, being the moron that he is, looks up to him like, oh my God, what do I do, Phil? You tell me you're such a genius. And then Phil says, oh, well, take advantage of your uh, the teachers that might be dying in Texas. <laughs> That's going to be great. It's going to uh, get us a lot of money. <laughs> That's Texas politics for you. If Rick Perry gets elected president, we're in a world of trouble, man. This guy has no scruples. Uh, there's nothing he won't sink to. And he has the world's worst advisors. Phil Graham, of course, is the guy on the left there next to John McCain. All right, so now you know. All right, now let's go to Fox News. It's a roller coaster today. Later, I'm going to hit Dick Cheney, okay? Uh, he's going to hit Obama. It's going to go round and round. Okay, so now we go to Fox News. Um, it, it's, it's interesting the different things that go on there, right? 
Uh, you know how Fox News loves to talk about global warming and they like to make fun of it. And every time it snows, they're like, what happened to global warming? It's snowing outside. <laughs> But here's the only problem. It turns out that they had their brain room look into it, as you're about to see, and they realized, oops, it's real. But they're going to try to figure out who's going to get the advantage of that anyway, because Huntsman, running for president on the Republican say, side, says it's real. Rick Perry says it's not, that it's made up by scientists. So let's watch this amusing clip from Fox. If you, fat, you know, sort of, if you if you get in, you dive into the weeds a little bit on this global warming thing. You see that it seems that facts are certainly on Huntsman's side on all of this, and fact checkers have come out, and we're actually having our own brain room look at this right now. That uh, any of Perry's comments on this don't seem to hold a lot of water, but it doesn't matter because what's resonating right now in South Carolina is helping Governor Perry tremendously, and he fired back at Huntsman on global warming, and it's gaining traction. Facts or not. I love Fox News, man. Facts or not, who cares, man? Rick Perry's kicking Huntsman's ass on this, yeah. And gee, I wonder where people got that misleading impression that global warming might not be real. Could it be that every time Fox and Friends specifically uh, comes on the air, talks about, ah, you know, there's scientists on one side, there's scientists on the other side. How many times have we shown you clips of Steve Ducey saying that on that program? How many times have we shown you snickering, uh, them snickering over uh, snowstorms on that program? Now, they just as a quick aside, well, you know, anyway, uh, our own brain room, which sounds <laughs> scary. Do they have a brain room at Fox News? Our barium looked into it. It turns out global warming is real. But anyway, move on. Advantage to Rick Perry, who says it's not. There's Fox News in a nutshell for you. In fact, that's the first time I've ever let the scene then let a fact slip out there. I don't know what went wrong. I don't know why they admitted that on air. So it's a little bit surprising. Now, I'm going to get back to Fox in a second, but let's stay on John Huntsman. Uh, John Huntsman's supposed to be the so-called moderate in the Republican race. So they're going to ask him, hey, listen, uh, would you allow rich people to also chip in during these tough economic times? I love that we even have to ask this question. Let's listen to his answer. I would say that there's going to have to be a shared sacrifice in this country. Uh, and I think that uh, people at all levels are going to have to step up, whether it's recognizing that Medicare is going to be done a little differently, Social Security is going to be done a little differently. And as president, uh, I wouldn't hesitate to call on a sacrifice from all of our people, even those at the very uh, highest end of the income uh, spectrum. Uh, I higher think taxes for the there's, the there is some, Well, I'm not saying higher <laughs> taxes. I'm saying that there are contributions that they can make too. I love that. Two things. One, even those at the highest end of the spectrum, we might even ask them to sacrifice just a tiny bit. Look at the logic of that. I mean, shouldn't it be the reverse? Shouldn't he be saying, well, even the ones who have been hit hardest, the poorest, the unemployed, we might ask them to chip in. He's saying, no, no, that's a given, obviously. Middle class, we're going to hit them super hard. The poor, we're going to hit hard. But we might even ask those at the highest level to chip in a tiny bit. Would it be through higher taxes? Oh, hell no, hell no, no way, no way. Not through higher taxes, even though taxes are at a record low right now for them. No, no. So what does he mean? What is he referring to? He's saying, well, we might means test Medicare or Social Security, which, by the way, is another Trojan horse. So once they start doing that, they say, hey, look, we're not going to give Medicare and Social Security to rich people, even though they paid into it. Then they're going to turn around and go, oh, Social Security and Medicare, they're just welfare. And look at all these welfare queens taking it, because they're, then they're going to say it doesn't go to everybody. That's a bad idea, man. I want Social Security going to everybody, including the richest people and Medicare as well. It's because it's not a welfare program. It's an insurance program. We pay into it, and we deserve our money back no matter what class we're in, okay? So all of these ideas are absolute nonsense. And the end, the only thing that they're going to benefit is rich people. And now when Republicans even talk about it, they're like, huh, I might even ask something of rich people. And that becomes like big news. They're like, wow. Republicans said something about he might ask a dime out of a rich guy. Wow. You get a sense of where the party is? If you don't, you're a knucklehead. Anybody who isn't stinking rich voting for Republicans is just asking to get robbed. All right, now back to Fox News and Karl Rove. Now, you know Karl Rove doesn't much love Sarah Palin. Uh, he's taken uh, plenty of shots at her. And uh, <laughs> there's not much love lost there on either side, because Sarah's not all awfully fond of him either. Now, they both work on Fox News. So uh, it's a little uncomfortable for Fox News. Well, Carl Rove's in the middle of a rant against her, and let's see what happens. 
She's a big, she's a potentially big factor in the presidential election. If she were to get in, she'd be a contender, as they say. She was the vice presidential nominee in 2008. She maintains a following. Uh, there, there are people who want her in, and there are some people who would be deeply concerned if she did, because she'd be eaten into their, into their ranks. But she's a player. And so if she doesn't want to be speculated about, then end the speculation by, by saying, I'm not going to be a candidate. Until then, I would just recommend she might get a slightly thicker skin, because if she's got this thin a skin now, when people are saying, well, I think she might be a candidate. What kind of, well, how is she going to react if she does get into the campaign and gets the scrutiny that every presidential candidate does get? I mean, th th that's not going to be a pretty sight if, she, if she's as thin-skinned in the, in the fray as she is uh, on the edges of it. Well, what you didn't see there is uh, they, had, they immediately went to a breaking news, breaking news, and they went to Steve Jobs resigning. So it has led to conspiracy theories that Fox News didn't like Karl Rove hitting Sarah Palin like that. Except I don't think Fox News timed Steve Jobs' retirement to make sure it interrupted a Karl Rove rant. So put those conspiracy theories aside, that's not true. But what is the interesting part of that clip is, you know, Rove and the establishment of Republicans definitely against Sarah Palin. Okay, now look, she's almost irrelevant now. She's slip sliding off that cliff of relevance. But part of the reason I bring you that clip is to uh, tell you why. So why have they turned on Sarah Palin when they used to love her? It, and you have to give Sarah Palin a really ironic credit here because she is an actual maverick in the sense that they have no idea what she's gonna do, right? And since they can't tell what's going on inside that head of hers, the establishment thinks we can't trust her. We, we need to make sure we get a guy in there that is a goddamn robot that takes his orders and just does exactly what we told him. That's why they love Mitt Romney. There, there, there is not a bigger corporate robot in the world than Mitt Romney. They're like, <laughs> Rove will be like, hey, Mitt, we need tax breaks for uh, corporations when they're repatriating uh, taxes. Mitt Romney will be like, we now must do a tax holiday to repatriate those funds for other corporations. There's no question, Romney is their perfect candidate, right? Sarah Palin, she's like, I'm gonna tax the oil companies. I'm gonna drill, baby, drill. I'm not gonna tax the oil companies. She doesn't even know where she stands. You think, she doesn't even know who Hamas is. I mean, I've gone back to that 100 times. She has no idea what's going on and heard she will not get some of those Washington advisors they want her to get. So they fear that if she becomes president, which again at this point seems like a minuscule chance, that she might accidentally go off the reservation uh, to you know, enrich herself and not enrich the rest of those establishment guys nearly enough. So that's why Sarah Palin is nearly done, man. And, you got, it, and the reverse of this conspiracy theory is what's actually happening on Fox News. Fox News doesn't let Karl Rove go out there and bash Sarah Palin if they don't think, hey, you know what, she's had a nice ride, but her work is done here. Not on Fox News, but as a national political figure. So they don't mind getting the ratings from her, but she, they, Roger Ailes must have made a decision. It's not her, okay? So now, the longer Perry sits on his lead, the more irrelevant uh, Palin becomes anyway. By the way, that's the lead we told you about yesterday. Three different polls. Rick Perry has double-digit lead. Romney's got to be... <laughs> Well, let me put it this way. Uh, we went to the doctor the other day uh, for a pro, uh, my uh, young son. A, he's about a year old. And uh, we were worried if he was sick, is he going to be all right? And the doctor said, he's all right if he does the pee-pee and the poo-poo. And he said it in kind of a funny way, so I've been laughing about it ever since. <laughs> anyway, so when those three polls came out, all of a sudden Mitt Romney goes from prohibitive favorite to down 12 points in almost all the polls. Mitt Romney must have done some pee-pee and a poo-poo in his pants. It's a long way of telling you that story. Anyway, all right, one last uh, uh, clip from Carl Rove and Fox News. Now, uh, Rove is gonna go on here uh, and he's gonna debate Bill Burton. Bill Burton is uh, uh, one of the uh, top, or was one of the top communications guy for the Obama administration and for the 2008 Obama campaign. He's now gone to form a super PAC to raise uh, gobs of corporate money for Obama 2012. Lovely, but he does do a good job here. Let's watch. 
Let's set the record straight about what Bill said earlier about, uh, the, about rigidity. Yes, there's rigidity in our political system, and it starts with the President of the United States. So, you know, I love it. The Republicans passed a budget. The Democrats in the Senate have it. The Republicans have passed a slew of job-creating measures, and the, Rep and the Democrats in the Senate have it. And the President now sits here and lectures us about how we need to take action. Well, what is his action? He has yet to put pen to paper and issue a jobs plan or a deficit reduction plan in the last nine months. You know, Carl, so please, don't say, talk to me about I ideological say, rigidity. Carl, it comes from, the, I, I it comes from your White House. I appreciate that you on this, Carl, but as someone who is a leader in a White House that turned a record surplus into a deficit, that got us involved in a war that we never should have been in, and turned the floor of the New York Stock Exchange into a casino, I don't think the American people are quite ready to hear a lecture from right, you on oh, good government. Hold on, Bill. What about you, you the know, question? Bill, I, hold I, on, I, Carl. I, I, wait a second. I appreciate the insults. I, I, I appreciate the insults, That's Bill, insult. but they don't Those do anything to advance it. And it's a fact of the matter. I like that, man. Bill Burton coming to play. Uh, he's like, hey, wait, aren't you the idiot that screwed up the entire deficit and left us a one? In fact, I thought he should have been even more specific. Left a $1.2 trillion deficit behind. So I got a big tall glass of shut up juice with your name on it. But you know, that's the way I would have done it. But I like the way Bill did it anyway. Nice elbow from the sky. All right, let's take a quick break and come right back. All right, back on the Young Turks. Jake Huger, uh, the host of TYT University, Anna Kasparian is here. <laughs> uh, you, you, look, part of the reason we play uh, Bus Nuts at TYTU and we mention it, yada, 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 on, is because I've started this internal competition between TYTU and TYT Sports. You didn't start it, but you are definitely helping to encourage it. Uh, yeah. To say that I'm putting fuel on the fire is a wild understatement. It is. And it's gotten under Anna's skin. And so she's like, y you see the subscriber total for TYTU? You see the viewer count? We're almost catching up. We're only 800,000 behind. Okay. No, but I'm Are you going to take that, Rick? Rick, you don't stand a chance. So, and, oh, and look, oh, 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 oh. Here's oh, the thing. She I, really, have done that. I really like Rick. I really like Rick. So I don't want to say things that will make him dislike me. However, you don't stand a chance. Oh. How can, how can you say TYT Sports stands no chance over the university people? Because sports, sports is a worldwide phenomenon. College is just a little part of life. Okay, but, okay, I'm not going to get into reasons, but let me just tell you something. TYT University Army is too strong. <laughs> <laughs> That's a weak song. Biggest right. comeback <laughs> ever. <laughs> right. I'm not going to get oh, into yeah. Oh, yeah? TYT Sports Army is also very strong. <laughs> Okay, anyway. Come on, we got the movie critic and me. What more could you want? <laughs> I mean. Right. Uh, all right, so listen, and football season's coming up. Uh, look, and but so is the fall uh, semester. Yes, So it is. Oof, it there's is. a drama within the TYT network. Anyway, uh, Anna, you will enjoy the post game today because I'm going to tell a story about how Steve-O's dad was the most powerful man in our hometown. Oh, damn. It's a bit of a... Exaggeration. But, but not much, okay? <laughs> okay, fun personal stories. Steve right. doesn't seem to look forward to it. Look no, at no, no, he likes that story. Okay. It's a good story. All right. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, forward. The Alaska mom story that we did last week, you know, the Alaska mother who poured hot sauce uh, into her son's mouth to punish him has been charged with child abuse. So I thought I would update you guys on that story. She's one of those people uh, that you would call a... These extremists. People were very upset at our commentary on that story, but I won't get into that. I can understand people disagreeing with us. Some were um, much more vocal about their disagreement than others, but... Right. Uh, oh, I can get into that. <laughs> okay. You're wrong. I'm right. What are you talking about? <laughs> End of this. <laughs> okay, no. Seriously, like, people were really, really upset at that mom for pouring the hot sauce into the kid and the freezing cold shower and the kids screaming. But you knuckleheads, we're also really upset at the mom. It's not like we think she should win a medal. We said over and over again, it's terrible, right? Right. The question is whether it's illegal or not, right? And, you know, and look, I, I, I still don't think it's illegal. Uh, and I wish she wouldn't do it, et cetera. But, and, you know, say, some people say it's psychological terror. You might be right. But then what else is psychological terror? Are we going to get in, into all the different parenting? Oh, you yelled at the kid too much. Or you put too much pressure on him to play the piano. It was psychological terror. I mean, it goes on and on. What she did was on tape. It was hideous. We all saw it. We all agree. I don't think it's criminal. But apparently, the state of Alaska does not agree. Right. The state of Alaska does not agree. She has been charged with uh, child abuse. Now, uh, I have more to this story, but I want Steve to comment first. 
Uh, the big advocate for doing this, uh, putting real spicy things on the kid's tongue, is actually that, that woman, uh, Blair, from Facts of Life. She grew up, and now she's like a big-time Christian right person, and she strongly advocates for that. And, and that's like a movement in the, on the Christian right to punish your kids by pouring hot sauce on their, on their tongue. Blair Welsh or whatever. Her yeah, name. I don't want anybody to mistake me. Lisa Well. Right. I, I don't want anybody to mistake what I'm saying. They're a bunch of weirdos, okay? Yeah. Like, they get some weird sadist thrill off of, like, hurting people, right? Like, I, I would never pour hot sauce on my kid's mouth. That's, it's not going to help them. It's only going to hurt them. It's so dumb, right? But why is it the Christian right that likes to do corporal punishment against their kids? We got another clip on that in, in, in a little bit, right? We do. And... and but wait a minute, would Jesus, I, again, look, I don't know enough about Jesus, if he even existed, etc. But I mean, the guy talks about peace throughout the New Testament. He doesn't seem like the kind of guy that's like, oh, smack the living crap out of your kids and pour hot sauce in their mouth. Yeah, Christian, right, yeah. I mean, it's, it's I don't even know. Their interpretations it, are always weird. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, okay, so let's get on with the Sean Hannity aspect of this story. So Sean Hannity brought uh, a prosecutor and also conservative radio host uh, Bill Cunningham on his program to kind of debate this situation. You know, should uh, parents be criminalized for corporal punishment? How far is too far? They have this discussion. They go back and forth. But I think that Bill Cunningham has the most outrageous comments throughout this um debate. Now, we have two videos for you. The first one, um, he talks about why he thinks that corporal punishment makes sense. Let's watch. The mother would level. say, go into the tree, get me a switch. You bring it back to me. And I remember this kid, I won't give his full name, his first name was Bob, would go in the woods. Echo? No, I wish it was. <laughs> clip off a switch and he'd bring back to his mother, bury your bottom, and she would hit him like this and several Welch? times. Welch would show this woman would lock up that poor woman and we don't need that. Okay. Uh, how is the mom there, the poor woman, and not the kid? Yeah, the welts, uh, that goes too far, okay? Yeah. Where you see welts, that's when you know it goes too far. And instead of saying, you know, instead of like condemning that, he's basically saying like, yeah, the mother hit him so hard that he had welts. That poor woman, she would have been prosecuted. Now, here's the difference between Bill Cunningham and, and what I'm saying, right? Now, I think it's an interesting question as to whether that woman in Alaska should be prosecuted or not. I don't think she should criminally for pouring the hot sauce into the kid's mouth and uh, the freezing cold showers, et cetera, right? But I don't celebrate it. Whereas Bill Cunningham's like, yeah, and then yeah. she take the stick and she hit him, hit him until there's marks. Oh, that poor woman, I can't believe that anybody would want to, you know, her not to do that. Yeah, we wouldn't want her to do that. It's not a good idea. And it doesn't it's, even really work. You're totally right about that. It's almost as if he's salivating at the thought. It's right. really weird. And throughout they're that sadists, entire- They're sadists, man. There's this weird thing about the Christian right where they're sadists and they like that corporal punishment. Now, he continues to talk about it, and in my opinion, in this next video, he just completely goes over the edge. Let's watch. But we need parents, spare the child, spoil the child. I say beat kids appropriately and with love. Oh. Yeah. Now, there's something wrong with a guy who can't wait to beat up on little kids. I agree. You know, he's like, yeah, with love. I, with love, I would beat them up. Yeah. No, dude, calm down, man. I mean, it's like he's looking forward to it. If I... I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to hit my kid. I don't think that's the right way to, to do things, right? I don't believe in that. Uh, but for some reason, if I had to hit my kid, it would be probably more traumatic for me than him because I'd hate to do it. I'm not like this lunatic who's like, yeah, let's hit him with love. That, that, what's wrong with you, man? It should be a bad moment for you, not a moment you enjoy. Even if you think it's the right thing to do, you should not look forward to it. There's something wrong with these people. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand why he, he seems to take pleasure in it. it. It's really weird. And, you know, he's being put on blast for his comments on uh, Sean Hannity's show, which I love. And by the way, the prosecutor that was on that panel with him, um, sh she was very reasonable throughout that interview. You know, she didn't uh, condemn people who want to punish their children, like corporal punishment. You know, she says it makes sense to a certain degree, like a little swat on the butt or something like that. You know, if you feel like you have to do that as a parent, no, you shouldn't be prosecuted. But she does say that there are certain times when it makes sense. And I, I personally think welts on the bottom um, should be prosecuted. I think that goes too far. Yeah. Look, man, I, like I told you, I got a 13-month-old at home. The thought of hitting him makes me want to vomit. Mm -hmm. Like, 
Oh, Jesus, hitting him? Like, what, are you crazy? And look, I know that it used to be different in the old days. That's why I'm saying, hey, you know, we're a society in transition. I don't want to put these people in jail if, you know, if they're hitting them on the butt or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And there's the spanking, et cetera. If they're causing blisters and welts, yes, you got to take action, et cetera. But me, personally, I, I almost can't imagine it. Hey, uh, Steve. Um, I, I, I have kids, and I've spanked them in the past. And, oh. I, and I stopped doing it because... Uh, Prosecute. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's why I stopped doing it. These extremists. <laughs> I stopped doing it because I realized when I was spanking them, it wasn't for them, it was for me. I was frustrated, and that's why I spanked them. It wasn't because it was good for them, it was, you know, they're going to learn a lesson. They would have learned a lesson anyway. That, that's why, when I, when I realized that, I said, that's it, I'm done. I'm not spanking them anymore. Wow, that's, that, you and, know what, that's kind of actually, putting the kidding aside, that's kind of a powerful admission. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I'm glad you came to that realization. And, um, I mean, now that you don't spank them, is it, are they harder to control? Well, no, and the reason why I spanked them is you know, they're little, and you couldn't really reason with them. So I was frustrated, so I spanked them. And, and, and But then that would defeat the point, right? right if you were trying right. to teach them a lesson, but they can't reason, then exactly. what's the point? It's more, it's more to just kind of um, domineer them and make them submit to my will, not because I'm right, but because they're just freaking scared, right? And that's wrong. So I, so I stopped that. And, you know, I think spanking is appropriate. Like Anna said, a swat on the butt when they're little. And, and my kids are way too old to be spanked anyway. But I stopped it early on when I realized I was doing it more out of selfish need to, to get my frustrations out rather than trying to teach them a, a lesson. Now, going to this guy on TV, he's a clown. These right-wingers, they love to act tough. That's what this is all about. I'm so tough. I beat the crap out of my kids. I'm not some liberal sissy. I'm a tough guy. They love that. Yeah. Real quick story on, on the Dogen. Uh, the Dogen uh, spanked me a couple of times. Okay. That doesn't surprise me. Okay. Uh, well, He's he, from the old school. He is from the old school, but it wasn't in him. Mm -hmm. You know, he like he, he did it kind of awkwardly. Didn't really, you know, he didn't uh -huh. get into it. <laughs> okay, and he felt like he had to because he had to teach me the value of doing my homework. And I remember the one time it was the Eagles uh, Raiders Super Bowl, and I was watching. You remember the story? I do, I do. And uh, and and I had it was an idiot and admitted to my dad that I hadn't done a report yet. That it was like a uh, week late or something. So he made me turn off the Super Bowl. I started crying or whatever or complaining, and so he said, okay, I must now do this, okay? <laughs> and then the spanking ensued, <laughs> okay? How old were you again? You'd have to look it up. Uh, Eagles Raiders, was that 81? Uh, yeah, so I was 11, okay. okay? So I was pretty old, you know, to, to get a spanking. But anyway, um, and I remember crying, right? Uh, and, uh, and then my dad would say, stop crying, and he'd hit me. <laughs> And I thought that was the most irrational thing that my dad had ever done. Because right. my dad's a very logical guy. And I remember thinking as an 11-year-old kid, well, I would stop crying if you would stop hitting me. <laughs> I'm like, this is really quite irrational. <laughs> it's very unlike you, uh, Dad. Yeah. And meanwhile, ah! <laughs> and you know, the th reason I cried wasn't that it hurt. I used, even back then, I used to get into fights, and you know, I liked the taste of blood in my mouth, and I was okay, a vicious. Okay, now little, you're creeping me out. Like we're talking about Satanists. And I know. I was a vicious little Turkish kid, right? Uh -huh. I think I was crying cause at the betrayal of my dad hitting. Mm -hmm. Okay, however light it was, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and I saw among the re 128 reasons why you shouldn't hit your kids. Yeah, for me, like my parents definitely, especially my mom, like she would definitely spank me, right? But it wasn't, you're right, it had nothing to do with the fact that it hurt, right? And it, in a lot of cases, it didn't hurt at all, right? But it was the disapproval that hurt the most. Right, so it was right. like, she's mad at me, she disapproves of something she, I've done. Telling your child that you're disappointed, I think, is more punishment. All right, one last thing on this, okay? I know we've taken a while on it, but uh, I, this, so my dad uh, became, uh, changed tactics. I mean, he barely did that, very few times. But his main tactic was disappointment. Mm -hmm. And it is a powerful tool. It is. Okay. And, to, I, and I still live under that yoke, okay? For better or for worse, and it's driven me to do really well, I think, I hope, right? But, or to try to do better, right? But at the same time, you feel like, oh, you're never gonna quite satisfy it, right? So there's a famous story of I get a 98 on a test. My dad's like, ah, oh, it's pretty good. Where'd the other two points go, right? Yes. And you're like, ah! <laughs> right? So, but I've decided, 
I'm going to use that with Pro. I think you should. I, I think that that's the most powerful tool, and I think it's effective. My parents were the same way. I remember spelling tests in second grade. Every single spelling test, I would get 100%, except there were a couple cases where I got too wrong, mm -hmm. right? And my parents would punish me if I got too wrong. It wasn't just, oh, we're disappointed. Like, oh, you're not going to go out and play with your friends on Friday night. Wow. That Man, kind of thing. They were more hardcore than yeah. even the Dogen. So, and I think that's part of the reason why I'm competitive, too. Look, it, it lives on forever, okay? Right. If your parents instill that, you, you, there's no... Right. And it's got an upside and a downside. So I still play around with it. My sister totally disagrees. She's like, don't do that to your kid. <laughs> okay. But I, I'm at least going to go, oh, well, that's interesting. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. A little disappointment. Huh. Registered. Duly noted. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>, see? <laughs> All right. Let's see what kind of damage I do. All right. Let's take a quick break here. Come right back.